Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight's lecturer, Johan Pillai, read literature at Yale University and took his MA and PhD from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Since then, he's been teaching at various universities in the States, Turkey, and Cyprus. With his wife, Amber, they co-founded the cultural center Side Streets, of which he was a director. As an associated professor of co comparative literature, he has written on American and European romanticism, British modernism, and Cypriot and Turkish art. In 2010, Johan wrote uh, a book on the work of the famous Turkish artist Petri Rahmi, The Lost Mosaic War from the Expo of 1958 to Cyprus. This is a wonderful rediscovery and reconstruction of a beautiful piece of art which we actually should try and have again. His interests include theory and critical interpretation, relations between text, image, and sound, rhetoric, and historiography. Tonight, Johann will give us his interpretation on how history is presented through art in Cyprus. Apart from anything else, I would like to welcome a very good friend. Thank you uh, all very much for coming, and thank you, Rita, for very nice introductions. And uh, I'd like to thank the Costas and uh, Rita Severus Foundation for having me here, and also uh, Evelyn and Holly for helping uh, make this uh, process work. Uh, this is a very interesting space. By the way, can you all hear me? Is it clear? All right. This is a very interesting space for me to be speaking in for various reasons, but two in particular. First, the modernity of the building, which to a casual observer obscures its historical or archaeological layering from its previous functions as an Ottoman Khan and as a flour mill. And secondly, the specialized collection of works by traveling artists and commentators. These works represent perceptions or objectifications of Cyprus from the past and from outside the island, but they're counterpointed in various ways by the works of the Cypriot artists in the collection and also by the perceptions of the people walking through the exhibition spaces today so that they have become part of Cypriot's own culture, heritage, identity, and subjective reality. So what I'm going to talk about today more generally are these kinds of layerings of art and history, the play between being an object or a subject, the question of whether you perceive yourself from outside or from inside, and how myths penetrate into realities. This is, in effect, a collection of thoughts which have occurred to me at different moments, and some of which I've addressed in different contexts, but which now seem to be coming together, for me at least, in a fairly coherent perspective. My first image on the slide shows you five different types of fictions. And I want to be very clear here that I'm using fictions not in a negative sense, but simply descriptively to mean heuristic fictions. In other words, constructs that we absorb and learn to treat as true or real for practical purposes. The first fiction is a text from Pliny about the Pyralis, a winged creature the size of a fly. Now there is actually a kind of moth found in Cyprus called the Pyralid, and it takes its name from this text. But insects, of course, have six legs, and Pliny's creature has only four, which already suggests that it's mythological in nature, and there's something else. It also lives in fire. Generally speaking, a myth is a practical fiction, a metaphorical story originally invented to describe or explain aspects of the world. And these stories can come to have various rituals associated with them. We have an endless array of fictions of this nature, some of which we dismiss as mere stories, some of which we subscribe to as part of our belief systems, and others which form part of our cultural traditions and practices. In many cases, 
their original significance as explanatory fictions has been lost, and we take them for granted as mere stories or habitual gestures. Take, for example, the story of Hercules killing the monster with many heads. If you cut off one head, two more grow in its place. The name of the monster, the Hydra, tells us it's a story about water, because if you try and block the flow of a river, the water forks and continues on either side of the blockage, two heads instead of one. So when Hercules kills the Hydra by cauterizing it at the neck, this is simply a story of damming a river near its source. The Medusa is a female figure with snakes for hair, and according to the story, any man who looks at her turns to stone. But as Freud pointed out, there are some versions of the myth in which when a woman raises her skirt, a man turns to stone. So the Medusa can be read as a figure of male sexual arousal when confronted with the fascination, and for some men, I suppose, the horror of female sexuality. The Christian ritual of taking communion, eating a body and drinking its blood, is, of course, a sublimation of human sacrifice and cannibalism in front of a sacrificial table, the altar. And in some folk dances in Cyprus, you can see one of the dancers in a lineup uh, rhythmically waving a handkerchief. If you ask people what the handkerchief is for, they'll usually say it's used by the leader to mark time. But if you look into the history of these dances and at early folk dances in the Black Sea region, you get a different perspective. In those, the men dance energetically with the handkerchiefs under their armpits. And when they're soaked with sweat, they wave them under the noses of the women. So the handkerchief today may simply be a relic of an old mating ritual complete with pheromones. In the same way, Pliny's Peralis has obvious affinities with mythological animals like phoenixes, dragons, and salamanders, and connotations of death and rebirth. But if we were to recontextualize the Peralis metaphorically in the present, we might also see this four-limbed creature in the context of today's myths as a figure of those whose identity is defined by and needs to remain in fire, in a state of constant flux, an uneasy harmony of conflicting ideals and economic interests, where, as Heraclitus tells us, all things are exchanged for fire and fire for all things, just as goods are for gold and gold for goods. As to the first, the ideals, there are around the world, as there are in Cyprus, people who are locked in struggles for ideologies, where an ideology might originally have had a reason, but through endless repetition has turned into a set of cliches and mantras that has become an end in itself, and where identity and happiness are defined by nothing more than investment in the cliches of the past and the future, at the expense of living in the present. As to the second, the economic interests, think of all the investment in practical terms, the money that has changed hands, the fortunes that have been accumulated, and all the careers, academic and otherwise, that have been made by taking advantage of the exchange of goods for gold in the marketing of what is called the Cyprus problem. The second construct on my slide is in the 12 stars around the coin, which represent the mix of philosophical, cultural, political, and economic concepts that somehow come together to define the ideal of something called Europe. And the third construct, another kind of imagined community, is indicated by the two words Kypros and Kybris, and it is the eschatological ideal of something that was invented in 1959-1960, where the two words represent, depending on one's point of view, a state, a nation, a nation-state, or two nations within a state, or two states, or so does not address the phallic aspect of the figure. But in any case, given this ambivalence, one can only wonder what this image signifies on the Cyprus euro coin. Does it suggest a pregnant pause in the Cyprus problem? the birth of a new era, an agenda of transsexuality or gender fluidity? Or is it just an innocuous image that both Greek and Turkish Cypriots could agree predates both communities, and therefore, because it has nothing whatsoever to do with anything today, constitutes common ground in Cyprus? This is not a trivial question, actually, because it has something to do with forgetting, which I'll return to in just a little bit. But the fifth construct on my slide is the coin itself, which has almost no intrinsic value, but is a token, a symbol, which is passed around in exchange for real goods based on our belief in its value. The power of this belief is so strong that in January 2009, on the 10th anniversary of economic and monetary union, 
a commemorative two euro coin was issued in all the European member states showing a stylized human figure being forcibly pulled off balance and dragged away by a giant euro sign. It's interesting, in the context of the Greek financial crisis of 2009, that this design was created by George Stamatopoulos, an engraver at the Bank of Greece. In 2015, in the midst of fears that Greece would leave the European Union, he designed another two euro coin to commemorate 30 years of the European flag, this one showing 12 people forming a human chain around the flag. But there's one more interesting image on the currency that I'd like to draw your attention to, and it's on the 10, 20, and 50 euro cent coins. This is the image of the Kyrenia ship, which doesn't exist, except as a reconstruction. The Bank of Cyprus and European Central Bank websites make it clear that this represents not cultural heritage, but, they say, I quote, a trading vessel which dates back to the 4th century BC and a symbol of Cyprus's seafaring history and its importance as a center of trade. And that's the end of the quote. You may notice that the description on both websites uses the abbreviation BC before Christ instead of the current religiously neutral BCE before the Common Era. And naturally, the websites neglect to mention that historically, in art and literature, the image of a ship's passage has always been associated with the voyage of the soul, and that at least since Plato's Republic, when the context was city-states, of course, the ship has been a political metaphor for the state. In this way, the economic symbol of the restored ship, which bears a rather interesting resemblance to the raft of the Medusa, glosses over the reality of the underlying shipwreck its location in an area designated as occupied, and all the associations that accompany it. Now, you may or may not choose to accept any or all of these interpretations, but the question they all circle around is that of how we can separate myth from reality, truth from fiction. It's a question of authenticity in art as in life. I was first confronted with this problem when I was a student. A lot of time was spent in art history classes building up the atmosphere of ancient Greece and Rome. We saw slides of ruins and temples, mosaics and frescoes, and statues like these. The idea was to really feel the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. Platonic ideas, the harmony of the spheres, the sense of order emerging from chaos, the focus on mathematical proportions, simplicity of line, Fate, tragic flaws, heroic ideals, a noble mind in a noble body. And this, of course, was very seductive. You didn't have to think about the realities of everyday life because you knew, at least until you got to Caligula, that the ancient Greeks and Romans were not like us. They were always gesturing meaningfully, posing enigmatically, and floating around ethereally in a daze of abstract calculations and noble principles. Food was intellectual, a dinner was a symposium, and even when they had sex or wars, they always did it archetypally or heroically. And there's something very compelling about these spare white statues, the elegance of the marble, the classical Greek kouros and kore figures, for example, standing straight, almost at attention. They look ahead, their lips in an eternal, mysterious half-smile, their eyes looking at who knows what in the dazzling, immortal world of platonic forms. And in the same way in Rome, on the right, the top image, Caligula's eyes gaze out into the distance, no doubt thinking of high ideals of honor, nobility, citizenship, the general good of the populace, or the noble traditions of Rome. And then we found out what the statues really looked like. Art historians noticed that there were traces of colored paint on the statues that had been left out in the air or dug up during the Renaissance or later, and they had concluded that originally they were painted. Work by archaeologists in the 1980s, notably Vincenzo Brinkmann and Ulrika Koch Brinkmann, produced reconstructions of what they looked like when they were painted. So the bubble of historical imagination burst. The painted bust of Caligula is not mysterious, elegant, or ideal. It's cheap-looking, cartoonish, and the eyes just look dull and stupid. Or what other fantasy can be cooked up? That the eyes represent his manliness or human qualities, sexual exhaustion from orgies, the psychopathy of a man who claimed divinity and ruthlessly had his opponents killed, or the benign emperor who introduced reforms and defended Rome. And now we realize that a large chunk of our idea of the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome was a fantasy concocted by past poets and historians who idealized it, conditioned by images that they misread, 
because they were missing the context of paint. And now we can't look at classical art in quite the same way anymore without a lot of effort. We know that these classical masterpieces originally looked like plastic toy shop action figures, badly painted, tacky, and tasteless. But, and here's the thing, oddly enough, the reason why we can say this is because the aesthetic we imagined in the past has shaped the reality of our aesthetic today. The reason why we can say these statues reflect bad taste is that they don't fit the tastes we have, which we got by misinterpreting them in the first place. This suggests that the substance of what we call art or history is in the end not the objects, images, or events which we use as historical evidence, but to a large extent it's the stuff we add to it, texts, concepts, arguments, and fantasies. In other words, it appears that there is no meaning inherent in the objects or events themselves. What we see in them as meaning depends on the contexts and frames we bring to them. The meaning of an artwork or historical event is produced by the observer or reader in the act of seeing, framing, and interpreting it. And that leaves us with two questions. How is the freedom to interpret limited so that it doesn't become purely subjective or arbitrary? And how do we establish whether an interpretation is good or bad, valid or not? But before I get to that, let me give you an example of another kind of shift in perception. Between 1980 and 1984, uh, 1994 actually, a restoration project was carried out in Rome on the frescoes of the Sistine Chapel. Now in earlier generations, when we looked at these frescoes, they had a kind of brownish tone to them, which the art historians admiringly referred to as delicate modeling chiaroscuro, or the technique of sfumato, the Italian word derives from the Latin word for smoke. This was the soft, smoky way in which the tones and colors merged gently into each other showing how carefully, with what finesse and subtlety, Michelangelo worked on light and shade, and how the subdued tones really suited the solemn atmosphere of the chapel. So there was a lot of arguing over whether the frescoes should be restored or not. Quite apart from the discussions of whether they would be damaged by the restoration process, historians, art historians, writers, members of the general public, all chimed in with arguments about how restoration would take away the aura of the work and the atmosphere of the chapel regardless of whether or not the result would give us a more accurate understanding of what the frescoes originally looked like. But what exactly is this aura or authenticity that they were concerned about? In a well-known essay on art and reproduction, Walter Benjamin defined the aura of a work as, and this is a quote, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. This unique existence of the work of art, he says, determined the history to which it was subject throughout the time of its existence. This includes the changes which it may have suffered in physical condition over the years, as well as the various changes in its ownership. The authenticity of a thing, he says, is the essence of all that is transmissible from its beginning, ranging from its duration as a substance to its testimony to the history which it has experienced after it was made. The restorations went ahead anyway, creating the image of the Sistine Chapel that the generations of the last two decades have grown up with. And it turned out that all the brown stuff was dirt. The accumulation over centuries of dust, smoke, soot, and other particles in the air, much of it caused by the constant flow of the faithful and tourists. The technique of sfumato turned out to be an accident of real smoke. But what was all the fuss about, and why did people object? As we saw with the classical sculptures, it was about a feeling of authenticity that people felt when they looked at the frescoes, conditioned for generations by art historians. It didn't matter that the scholars had mistaken dirt for technique. Now this dirt, when you think about it, was the only sign of what had happened to the frescoes after they were produced. It was a sign of age and deterioration because it was a collection of traces that generations of visitors had left on the frescoes for centuries. These traces, in other words, were the only signs of the fresco's history. This means that what the restoration work did by removing the dirt was to erase history. Now you may think that's a good thing. The image on the right looks much clearer and more colorful, although at first a lot of people who had got used to the dirty version were shocked and horrified when they saw the restorations because it upset their ideas of the chapel and Michelangelo. 
But it's only taken a generation or two of reprogramming brains in textbooks and universities and through the media to get people to accept the new understanding. But it's still problematic. It's an issue that underlies any kind of restoration work, whether it's paintings, statues, buildings, or whatever, and for a simple reason. You may think, now we know what they really look like, but in fact, you don't. What you're doing is ignoring, jumping over, hundreds of years of history and imagining that you can look at a Renaissance fresco in the same way that a person would have looked at it at that time. And that is an understandable but rather ridiculous fantasy. You're not living in the Renaissance. Your ideas of how people felt and thought are based on your experience today and on what you've imagined by reading texts from the period and later history books where historians have told you what they have imagined and constructed. So basically, what the restoration accomplished was it made you replace one set of fictions with another. In this context, let me show you a work by the Turkish Cypriot artist Emin Chizanel. This is from a 2008 series by the artist called Provocation, which is linked to another series of his called Phoenix Again, and it's made up of various sizes of paintings. This one is about two meters by two meters, and it's created using the soot from candle flames. Sivar, incidentally, has on its walls part of another related project by Chisanel called Chosen Tree, which is based on a representation of flame in connection with Belapai's Abbey. These paintings take the artist months to complete, and they are made not by moving the candle over the canvas, but by painstakingly moving the canvas by hand over a candle flame, inch by inch, very precisely, in a room with no air movement that might disturb the flame. This painting looks quite abstract, but it is, in fact, a very rich commentary on the history of art, on restoration, and on the nature of history in general. Like charcoal, which is also formed of carbon, soot has historically been used as a base for calligraphers' ink, as an additive to the amber resin used in the first oil paints to create printer's ink, and also as a symbolic coloring agent in shamanistic and other types of rituals. Today, soot particles in the air from industrial and other types of smoke is thought to be responsible for most of the global warming effects of carbon dioxide because soot settles on snow and ice and inhibits reflection of the sun's radiation. Inhalation of atmospheric soot particles is also a health problem in developing countries. And soot is a major issue in the conservation and restoration of art as it's deposited and accumulates over time, causing damage to all kinds of artworks. So given these contexts, which the artist, of course, is fully aware of, but are never explicitly stated, only implied in the work, Emin Chisenel's provocation represents quite a profound reflection on the history of art and on con contemporary issues, on the processes of memory and forgetting, and on history itself. They are formed out of the traces of soot, a medium which is paradoxically both an integral part of the history of painting and writing, and the primary source of damage to art which curators and restorers try to remove, thereby erasing from artworks the traces of their history. Chisenel's work foregrounds soot as the mark and the trace, the actual substance of history. And these works represent his projects to restore the aura to painting, using the dirt of history as the medium of painting and as the painting itself. But there's another dimension to the aura, or the feeling of authenticity. In my example of the painted classical sculptures, the aura was lost by adding something to them, the missing paint that represented history. In the example of the Sistine Chapel frescoes, the aura was lost by removing something from them, the dirt that represented history. Our need, our obsession, if you will, for this feeling of place and time is why we love to collect old manuscripts and paintings. Why don't we just take good high-resolution photographs of them and throw away the originals? This is why we like to visit ruins. I think you would agree that there would be a feeling of loss if you visited Ephesus or the Acropolis, uh, Acropolis and found that it wasn't ruined anymore because it had all been reconstructed and renovated. Seeing a reproduction of the Kyrenia ship floating may be a nice Disneyland sort of experience, but it's not quite the same as standing in front of the shipwreck. A block from where I live, close to Ludra Palace, there's a building on which you can still see bullet holes from 1974 the external signs of part of the trauma it has undergone. Next to it, on the left, you can see the adjacent building, which has been patched up. The Lebanese critic and theorist Jalal Tufik noticed a rather similar phenomenon in Beirut. After the 15-year civil war in Lebanon, 
Much of the city had been reduced to ruins, with the buildings, of course, in far worse condition than the one on my slide. The Lebanese government embarked on a reconstruction project on a huge scale, and new buildings sprang up everywhere. As the reconstruction went on, Tufik noticed several curious phenomena, and I'll just give you two of them. First, archaeologists are never interested in preserving recent ruins, only ancient ones. That's food for thought. And secondly, visitors to Beirut were never interested in the new buildings, but always kept taking pictures of the ones that were ruined. Tusik has developed a rather complex theorization of ruins around his observations, which I won't go into, but I'll give you a very simple explanation of one aspect of it. He argues that the buildings, which have all the explicit evidence of ruin on them, are not really ruins, because they are simply signs of their own closure. The real ruins are actually the adjacent and surrounding buildings, which do not appear to have suffered any damage, or which have been patched and restored, so they look, for all practical purposes, untouched. These are, he says, ruins in the sense that they have passed through trauma but show no visible signs of it. They are, as it were, the spaces of psychological ruins in which trauma remains without closure and which are places, he says, haunted by the living who inhabit them. And so, he says, I predict that when war-damaged buildings have vanished from Beirut's landscape, some people will begin complaining to psychiatrists that they are apprehending even reconstructed buildings as ruins. The way out of this, the way to resolve it, may well be to come to terms with it through forgetting. By forgetting, let me be very clear about this, I don't mean losing sight of something entirely. I mean acknowledging it and then placing it in brackets so that it doesn't remain the central and dominant focus of one's narrative. And I'm using the word narrative here very deliberately because I'm thinking of how the mind processes events in everyday life. In general, first you have a lived experience an event, an everyday encounter, a celebration, an election, perhaps a trauma like a war. That's the lived experience. Immediately after it happens, it's no longer a lived experience, it becomes a memory. And as time passes, your mind, for various psychological reasons, unconsciously distorts it through processes of forgetting, metaphors and projections, even if you don't think that's the case. And your mind tries to make sense of it by blocking, selecting, modifying it, and putting it in the form of a narrative. The processes of blocking, selecting, and modifying are the processes of forgetting. Some are involuntary coping mechanisms, and some are voluntary, but they enable you to reshape the narrative of your identity. The effect of this historical and psychological process is that your lived experience has been transformed, first into memories, and then into literature. Your mind is full of literature. It is a collection of narratives stories you tell in ways that you choose as the truth to others and which constitute your identity. So here's a simple illustration of this. Supposing you're in a traffic accident and you wake up in hospital with amnesia, you've lost your memory. What would your first thought be? Probably first, where am I? And then more disturbingly, who am I? So besides it's making you disoriented in terms of space and place, when you lose your memory, you lose all your narratives about the past the stories, the literature your mind holds, and which make up your sense of identity. And this is why people who come and help you to recover your memory keep telling you stories. Do you remember when this happened and when that happened? And so on. And of course, only some of these narratives are derived from personal experience. It's in the interest of nations and states to ensure that their populations also have a collective or group identity that brings them together and establishes the border between them and other groups defined as different, the other, or the enemy. This group identity is achieved, as Gramsci and Althusser observed, simply by indoctrinating a population with a standard narrative, from the time they are children and believe anything you tell them in schools, till they become adults. And this is why states have control over history textbooks, and why certain works of art, architecture, literature, and music attain the status of cultural heritage. These are the instantly recognizable signposts or landmarks in the official narrative of an imagined community, the ideology which allows an individual to use the personal pronoun we, we Europeans, we Cypriots, in our culture we do it like this, and so on. These collective fictions can only be sustained if everybody subscribes to the same narrative. But there is a danger. After all, it is a narrative, a story, 
And stories can be interpreted in lots of different ways. So in order to ensure that the narrative can only be read in one way and can't be reshaped in any other way, there are warning signs posted everywhere and carved in stone saying, I will not forget. And this is the underlying logic of all of those slogans and the monuments. On the surface, they are to remember people and events, but in essence, they serve psychologically to mark the borders within the, which the dominant narrative must function and to limit the possibilities of your interpreting it in any other way. Now, we're accustomed to thinking of history as being made up of truths and facts rather than narratives, but there's a little problem with that, which I'll try and illustrate using a few maps. The first of these shows part of a facsimile of a copy of a Roman scroll map made around 250 CE, which shows trading centers, places of pilgrimage, and road systems. The odd hedgehog-shaped marked Insula Kipros bears little resemblance to today's maps of Cyprus, but there is one zigzag line around the inside of the coast and across part of the middle of the island, which represents a road, and there's another one overland with distances on both roads being marked in Roman miles, and there are cities marked as well. My second map of Cyprus was printed in 1522 to 23, and it's one of several different versions in the sea atlas of the Ottoman admiral Piri Reis. This one looks a bit more like what we think of the shape of Cyprus. But why does it have big chunks bitten out of the coastline? Well, unlike the Roman map, which was accurately designed for foot soldiers, the Romans weren't very good at sailing, this is designed for Ottoman sailors. And that's why the harbors are marked but exaggerated. The shape of Cyprus changes again during the 16th to 17th centuries, uh, as you see in this map, and sometimes these maps come with text that add a different perspective. This is from 1606 by Ortelius, and it comes with a text that warns us the air in Cyprus is not very wholesome nor healthful, but by way of compensation adds the people generally do give themselves to pleasures, sports, and voluptuousness, the women are very wanton and of light behavior. And I've enlarged part of this image so you can clearly see the presence of a sea monster on the left in the water near the island. And then there are more recent maps. There's a map of Cyprus, for example, that appears on several internet sites and written across the top is a description, area inaccessible because of the Turkish occupation. An Encyclopedia Britannica map shows the island divided into two parts the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, and in the south, the Republic of Cyprus. And the CIA map on the internet reflects American policy towards Cyprus. It captions the north, Turkish Cypriot administered area, and the south, area controlled by Cyprus government, Greek Cypriot area. There are, of course, hundreds of other maps of Cyprus one could cite. The Boutros Boutros Gali map, the maps created from various versions of Kofi Annan's plan. The map by the fellow who claims the lost city of Atlantis is in the water under Cyprus. Or another version of Atlantis or El Dorado, the map of the oil and gas reserves under the island, and so on. But there is something we can draw from all of these images. The maps are actually all accurate and correct, even though they all look different. When each map was made or published, Cyprus really looked like that. Each map maker or distributor provided the facts they needed for their purpose, and Cyprus, uh, it was a fact, was actually shaped like that because particular communities of interpreters agreed on it. These maps, these interpretations of the island, are not fakes, but simulations. The distinction here, which I take from Jean Baudrillard, is someone who fakes an illness can simply go to bed and pretend he is ill. In other words, he isn't really ill, and there's a clear distinction between the image he's projecting and the reality but someone who simulates an illness produces in himself some of the symptoms. In other words, the experience is psychosomatic. The image contaminates and becomes part of physical reality. This is how ideological narratives work. They are simulations which are taken to be truths in the minds of those who subscribe to them unquestioningly. So historically, as I have shown you, the shape of Cyprus has actually changed in the same way that the shape of the world has changed in different eras. Depending on the knowledge available or chosen, there have been times when the world was flat. There have actually been times when you could sail off the edge or actually meet sea monsters. Because there was a consensus that these were facts and truths, they actually were. And because each context produces a different truth, facts and truths change. I suggested earlier 
that the meaning of an artwork or text or historical event is not inherent in it, but produced by the observer or reader in the act of seeing, framing, and interpreting it. What constrains our freedom to interpret, what prevents us from making things mean whatever we want them to, what establishes whether an interpretation is good or bad, valid or not, is simply the consensus of the community of interpreters who represent the tradition of interpretation or are taken to be authoritative. Whether an interpretation of a religious scripture is designated true or correct or not, for instance, depends on whether or not it conforms to the claims to truth and the ideological consensus of the authorities who establish the interpretive community in a particular branch or sect of the religion. The admissibility of an interpretation in art history depends on the willingness of authoritative art historians to invest in it. The validity of an interpretation in science depends on the consensus of the scientific community. And whether a country's or government's actions are interpreted by others as acceptable or not depends simply on the politics and economics of something vaguely known as the international community. The facts, in other words, are only stabilized provisionally. This is why Nietzsche, in a famous passage, can say, what then is truth? And he answers his own question. It is a mobile army of metaphors, metonymies, and anthropomorphisms. In short, it is a sum of human relations which have been enhanced, transposed, and embellished poetically and rhetorically, and which, after long use, seem to be fixed, firm, canonical, and obligatory to a people. Truths are illusions about which one has forgotten that this is what they are. Metaphors which are worn out and without sensuous power. Coins which have lost their pictures and now matter only as metal, no longer as coins. And he continues, we still do not know where the urge for truth comes from, for as yet we have heard only of the obligation imposed by society that it should exist. To be truthful means using the customary metaphors. In moral terms, it is the obligation to lie according to a fixed convention, to lie herd like in a style obligatory for all. I would like to end with a final example illustrating this mobile and mutable nature of truth. Sir George Hill's History of Cyprus tells us of another fiction, one which surrounds a building in Cyprus. He writes, it was in 632, if we could believe a Greek writer, the Eastern historians know nothing about the matter, that the Arab invaders first showed themselves in Cyprus under Abu Bekr, the father-in-law of the prophet. We have no details of such a raid, except a doubtful tradition that it was Abu Bekr's daughter who died in Cyprus and whose tomb is at the Hala Sultan Teke near Larnaca. And the probability is that it never took place. That's the fiction. Now there is a documented series of Arab raids from the 7th to the 10th centuries, but after this period, the references peter out. And with the exception of the Maronites, of course, I couldn't find any specific references to a larger Arab presence on the island. So it really was with great pleasure some 20 odd years ago when the borders were still closed and I was sitting in a cafe in the north of Cyprus that I encountered a Bedouin. He appeared at my table on the cover of a matchbox that I subsequently learned could be found everywhere in Cyprus. And I've enlarged it to show you some details of the front and the back. When I asked about it, it turned out that a visitor from the British military base at Dekelia had brought it across the border. The Bedouin had traveled from England to the south of Cyprus into British sovereign territory and then across the dead zone to the north, and there he was, not respecting any borders at all. The Bedouin is a nomad, a figure who isn't held within the traditional limits of geographical boundaries, someone who can't be defined in national terms and defines himself by refusing all location. So because he's both inside and outside the limits of nations and states, he's the sign of an identity which refuses to be identified. But why a matchbox? The answer very quickly became obvious. The image on the front of the box, when you see it close up, does not show a peaceful nomad in his camp, but the British stereotype from the film Lawrence of Arabia of those uncontrollable and undisciplined desert warriors who wave guns around and behave in a damnably uncivilized and un-British manner until Peter O'Toole shows up and tells them what's what. And in fact, the image is a sort of negative version of Major Lawrence in the film. The Bedouin's pose is actually a conflation of several of the Englishman's poses in native clothing, 
The camel has been replaced by a dark horse, and the Bedouin's face is modeled on the bearded face of the tribal leader, Alda Abu Tayyip. The background is yellow, the Bedouin is dressed in red, and apart from a red tasseled decoration on the front of the horse, the rest of the picture is drawn in black. The image is a brilliant colonial metaphor for the otherness of fire raising out of control. And the message on the back of the box reinforces our stereotype of the Bedouin as a corrupter of youth, or worse, a kidnapper. It says, Makria apopedia, keep away from children. What then can save us from the horrors of the Bedouin? If you start at the top and read the image downwards, you see that the most dangerous element, the gun, links the words the Bedouin together. The danger is also suggested by the skull-like face of the warrior and his fiery red clothing. Further down, there's the horse rearing up, but then on the right, there's a palm tree and more vegetation as you get to the bottom of the image. This indicates the presence of water, something that can extinguish fire and hold back the Bedouin. But what is the source of this water? The text below reassures us, it's okay, don't worry, there's no danger. This is a safety match made in England. The Bedouin made in England, and that is to say, constructed as a fiction and then framed and held in a prison house of language, guarded by the language of colonial power. After my first encounter with the Bedouin, I asked at the cafe if they had any more of these matchboxes. It turned out that they had a whole packet and they gave me one. Imagine my surprise when I looked at the front and saw the words, safety match, made in Sweden. How could the identical matchbox have been made in England and made in Sweden? The answer was on the back in the fourth and fifth lines of the Greek, Hora Paragogis Swedia, Ine Agora, country of production, Sweden, common market. And the other box says England, common market. The language of colonial control had slipped into a language of economic control. And the Bedouin had turned, alas, into a European commodity, the tragic victim of a semiotic slave trade. This is how I read it at the time. Today, however, while the Bedouin matchbox still retains traces of these interpretations, it has shifted into a new context in Cyprus, the context of displaced people, refugees and asylum seekers, and of those crossing borders illegally. It now represents a different kind of truth. And so I would like to leave you with this thought, that as the meanings of representations and simulations of reality change, Truths and realities shift with them. And in the end, perhaps the questions in Cyprus, in art or in life, should not be, what does it mean, or is it true, or is it a fact? But instead, how has this meaning or truth been constructed? How is it being used? How is it circumscribed? Who is controlling it? And how might it be changed? Thank you. Of course. <laughs> or I could run away. <laughs> yes. I'm struck by your, if you can go back to the slide, the reconstruction of the Sistine uh, Chapel. Mm. The, the Daniel image. Yeah. Yes. In your description of how people respond to the screen, you left out what was very much the focus of my own training, rather than the art history, which is, yes, there was this history, yes, it looked like this, and I went through that, and now we're through it, and how do we, given our own changes and history and story, how do we today respond to this, which is, we hope, close to what the collapse of And that's a very different proposition from the ones that we yeah, the reason why I didn't uh, um, address that specifically because that is because that opens a different kind of Pandora's box because yes, there's an assumption, <laughs> yeah, because there's an assumption there that you can know what the artist intended. No. Right, because you said yeah, getting close to what the artist intended. No, I didn't say that. You actually did. I, no, I said what? <laughs> Playback the tape. Oh, okay. Right. What it looks like. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. So, now, uh, what he intended in terms of meaning is not what I yeah. was 
Uh, all right. So, okay, let's take what it looked like at the time. Um, well, it's what it looked like at the time for those of us looking at it from our time. Yeah. Right. So there's always going to be this loss, this historical distance, because you can never see it the way it would have been seen at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. So what that means is that whenever we're looking at a work, uh, and there's a, there's a very sort of simple model of this. Once a work is produced, it has all the possibilities uh, of interpretation at the, t at the time it was produced. Okay? And then the work kind of changes historically. So the work that's in front of you, even if it's in the same form and with the same appearance that it was a thousand years ago or 500 years ago, it's not the same work. Because... Right. Well, yeah, well, it's, it's not the same work in the sense that there has been cultural change, there's been historical change. Your context is not, for example, if you walk into uh, a church today, you don't walk into it the same way someone perhaps in the Middle Ages would have walked into the same uh, church or cathedral. So what we do is we create interpretive fictions of what it must have been like. And then we say, that fiction that I've now projected and assume was the case at the time. Well, yes. again, it's that interpretive. I'm yeah. not trying to say I understand, I, as I am today, how the people who saw it in the 16th century understood Yeah. I'm only saying, all right, how do I, in the 21st century, respond to the colors that may have been those originally? Sure. And the shapes in which Okay. And that's the piece I said was missing from Ah, yes, of course. And that's, that, well, it's implicit. Yeah, because it's always a construction in the present that you're producing. Okay. Yeah. Um, ah, okay, yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't know where to stop. <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah, obviously, yes. So I'm, I'm thinking of all of this because all the works that we see, although, for example, when you walk through a, a museum, you see things arranged in chronological order. It's taking you on a... Awesome. Trip, often, yes, through, uh, through chronology. It's taking on a trip through history. Okay? But actually, that's an illusion as well, because all of them exist at the same moment that you're watching it. So it's that kind of, I think, yes, I, I think we were at cross-purposes for a moment. But yeah, I, no, no, yeah. I absolutely agree with yeah. that. Um, you know, it's just that one piece yeah. that I thought was missing. Yeah. The other thing okay. I want to take issue, and you take issue mm -hmm. with it, you said um, was the sort of blanket statement that archaeologists don't preserve modern history? Uh, yeah, well. I mean, the Pergamon Museum has all of its damage from World War II yeah. purposefully preserved as part yeah. of its history. Yeah. Um, well, the context that, uh, that I was quoting from Tusik uh, here, um, he was talking about the fact that um, the, you know, if a building is broken down or sort of mm -hmm. damaged in an earthquake mm -hmm. or in a fire right now. Okay. Um, we tend to just repair it and get on with life. Okay. okay. So uh, what, and unless we sense that there is some historical value in this okay. event, and that's usually done retrospectively. Okay. It's not in the present that it's done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, you can use um, that's a rather interesting question because in many cases what people an art historical interpretation is not, in many cases, I'm waiting for you to jump on me there, <laughs> okay. uh, an art historical uh, interpretation in many cases simply means using the work as an illustration of history. So it's more history than interpretation in that sense. Okay? It's, it's based on uh, knowledge. Whereas, for example, uh, the kinds of interpretations that I was doing, uh, that I was doing here with the matchbox and so on, those are not based on knowledge. They're based on arbitrary associations that come to mind. So there are two ways of doing this. Uh, you could use an artwork and go back and make a comment on history through it, 
or you can actually use the artwork simply uh, as a as an illustration for a historical thesis. Yeah. Thank you, Sally. This is because I, I, um, I'm quite interested in how we can use our as historical sources and not as as the statements in existing. But what I was uh, thinking about because we were talking about narratives, how does that look for me? Because we use language also um, to create a knowledge, uh, to create knowledge about history, to create narratives. And how does that creation of knowledge through language, or through the language of art, maybe, in art history? Then again connects to facts hmm. and the needs yeah. and the expectations. I think that's a quite an interesting web of connections that you can create. So my question is, how does that become? Um, it, it depends on the specific context um, you were talking about. Um, I think um, the, the first thing is that the meanings of words are not fixed in any way, right? So there are all these potential possible meanings. Uh, words that meant something 50 years ago have changed their meanings today and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of sort of flexibility and language can always be read and misinterpreted metaphorically. Even in everyday language, we constantly argue over things that we've misunderstood. And people will say to you, oh, you said that and I didn't mean to say that. Well, you said it. Yes, <laughs> right? So. Um, so we have this sort of problem. Now, the, the, the problem with facts and truths is that when we talk about something as a fact or as a truth, it means that the meaning has been stabilized in some way. Okay. And what interests me here is how is that meaning stabilized? Uh, so, for example, supposing I do an interpretation and everyone says, well, I say, okay, this is about pizza. And you say, no, the Mona Lisa is not about pizza. Right. Now, uh, I, can, I can insist, well, no, look at the colors. It, it looks, gives me the same feeling that I have when I eat pizza, okay? And nobody's going to buy it. And that's the key to it, because that community has got to buy it, right? And then once they accept it, then it becomes the thing that everybody quotes and repeats as a fact. Uh, so uh, the stabilization is produced by a community of interpreters. So it's a commonly agreed... It's, yeah, and it's subject to change as well. Exactly. Yeah, so that... You can do something. This is why we have footnotes at the ends of articles, right? And this is why we don't say you're wrong. We say, well, I have an interesting modification of so-and-so's work. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, yeah, uh, because that allows you to kind of change the tradition s slightly from within, yeah. yeah, without radicalizing it. So that's the, yeah, that's the sort of short answer to that. Right. Yeah. And you put the wrong comma, the wrong words, you can start the wrong. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think this uh, business of language is um, when when I when I think of language, I don't just think of words and texts, okay? because there's body language, there's visual language, uh, so uh, it includes all of those different aspects. Uh, and it's also struck me, you just reminded me of something that I didn't say, but I was thinking about in connection with what both of you said. Um, you know that, well, from my childhood, there are very few photographs because people didn't take photographs of everything. You had to get them developed in, in rolls of film and so on. Um, so what that means is that I have perhaps 25 photographs of most of my childhood, but I have stories and I can create or fictionalize my past. Whereas the new generations who are growing up on this uh, technology where every minute has been filmed and videotaped, they cannot change their past in any way. And this is something that I think will, in the future, will, will sort of come to light, that you, know, you, you can't forget. Even if you're trying to overcome trauma, it's always there sticking in your face on the internet somewhere. Um, so uh, this is part of the logic of forgetting Okay, that certain images and certain types of meanings have to be pushed out of the foreground into the back. Yeah. There's another aspect of language that we need to think about. When you learn another language, you discover a different world of view. And that then covers everything that we do in that way. Yeah. And there's another whole set of things. Yeah, yeah. That's... Yeah, uh, I had to stop somewhere. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's a little bit on memory. Of course, when we talk about memory, it's not just about the hindsight of So our memory, of course, changes also because later on we know how the story ended, and very often we adjust, not knowing, not intentionally, um, how we remember. And I think uh, one of the major issues here is it has some of our eyewitness, uh, eyewitness and eyewitness accounts. How reliable are they really? Um, depending how how many stages of changes have they undergone until they reach the current stage. So that's something interesting to have in mind. And I think it, it, it connects again to with what you said. Yeah. Um, yeah. The problem. I think is that uh, we it's, it's just a collection of stories, <laughs> and that's it. Uh, so because you're interpreting literature, uh, and you know history books are literature, and there's a you know the great complication: what happens if something really happened and somebody says it didn't happen? Right. Well, then you need a community that says no, it did happen. You cannot read it in that way. So this is the the stabilization. Again, those memory as part of the process. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Very, very much. Thank you all very much. Very wonderful lecture. Wonderful lecture, really. Um, um, want the transcript, of course. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank and you all very much. Thank you, thank you for you. making the effort and coming here, Johan. <laughs> it was our pleasure and our honor. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody. I think that from now on, we're going to relax. Yes, summer is in. The heat has arrived. So I think with Johan's lecture, this was the last of a series of events in CBR until September, except for maybe one or two small ones in July. Thank you all for being here. Are you going to share the time? Of course, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I, I had originally planned to do something quite different with this, and that was to put together what you said that I had omitted <laughs> as a kind of model and to explain well, that. But I had it all, and then I sort of started cutting out pages and saying, 45 minutes, and I should start, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm your hand. Pamela Seaford. Are you teaching someone? I am. I have three of you here. Oh, hi. Uh, uh, yeah, I teach at Life on the College. After.